We know that there are multiple different exercises which can all train the same muscles. However, not all exercises are equally effective. One of the reasons for this is due to the length that it trains the muscle at. In this video, we will explain how exactly muscle length influences hypertrophy and what this means from a practical perspective in our training routines. First, let's cover some fundamental principles of hypertrophy training. We know that to induce muscle growth, we need to stress the target muscle through dynamic resistance training. To do this, we basically need to train fairly close to failure in the approximate 6 to 20 rep range with a fairly high number of sets per week. It is this stress that causes a disruption to homeostasis and muscle growth as an adaptation to this stress. However, not all stress is created equal. While there are many different training methods within these general guidelines, which can all be similarly effective at inducing muscle growth, we may be able to induce more of a stimulus with each set by strategically manipulating certain variables. And one way this can be done is by training at certain muscle lengths. To understand how muscle length influences hypertrophy, we first need to look at the basic anatomy of a muscle. Each muscle is basically made up of a bunch of contractile tissue, which shortens and lengthens to produce force. As the fibers contract, the muscle shortens pulling each attachment site closer together and moving a specific joint. As the fibers relax or contract eccentrically, the muscle lengthens back to its relaxed state due to gravitational force. Furthermore, most major muscles don't just move a single joint, they usually act to move two or more joints. For example, the hamstrings originate on the pelvis and insert onto the tibia and fibula, which are the bones of the lower leg. This means they cross both the hip joint and the knee joint and act to move both. So if we sit down, for example, the hamstrings will be lengthened at the hip. And if we stand up, they will be shortened at the hip, regardless of what happens at the knee. This is an important concept to understand for the rest of this video. So now getting back to the original question, how does muscle length influence hypertrophy? Well, there is now quite clear evidence that training a muscle at longer lengths seems to be more hypertrophic compared with training at shorter muscle lengths. There are two prominent studies demonstrating this idea, which we will now cover. First, this study explored the effects of performing seated versus lying hamstring curls. As we mentioned earlier, the seated curls naturally place the hamstrings at a longer muscle length, while the lying leg curls place the hamstrings in a shorter position. As we can see, the seated leg curl resulted in superior hamstrings hypertrophy compared with the lying leg curl for all hamstrings muscles, apart from the short head of the biceps femoris. These results make sense because the biceps femoris short head is the only portion of the hamstrings muscles which only act on the knee joint. So the hip position didn't influence this part of the hamstrings, which means that the stimulus was basically the same with both the seated and lying leg curls. And the other study we have explored the effects of partial range of motion training for the biceps at either a long or short muscle length. One group performed partial preacher curls in the top portion of the lift where the biceps are shortened, and the other group performed partials at the bottom portion where the biceps are more lengthened. And as we can see, the group training at a longer muscle length saw superior muscle growth of the biceps compared with training at a shorter length. So taking these two studies together, it suggests that training a muscle at long lengths seems to be superior to training at short lengths. The exact reasons for this are not entirely clear at this point. We just know that when the muscle is in a stretched position during resistance training, it seems to achieve a better hypertrophic stimulus. This is all well and good in theory, but what does this actually mean for trainees in the gym? Well, this has two practical implications that we can apply to our own training to maximize muscle growth. The first implication is for exercise selection. Like we mentioned at the beginning of the video, there are multiple different exercises which can all train the same muscles. However, not all exercises may induce the same hypertrophic stimulus for each muscle. One way that we can make better exercise decisions is by considering muscle length. If an exercise trains a muscle at a longer length, 
it should probably be preferenced over an exercise which trains the muscle at a shorter length. It should be noted that this isn't the only consideration for exercise selection, there are many other factors to consider too. All it means is that if two exercises are similar, but one trains the muscle at a longer length, then it may be a better option to implement. For example, let's look at the long head of the triceps. While the two short heads only cross the elbow joint, the long head crosses the shoulder and contributes to shoulder extension, which is the movement we would see during something like a lat pullover. So let's compare a cable triceps pushdown with a skull crusher. A cable triceps pushdown will certainly train all heads of the triceps, as will the skull crusher, and range of motion will be similar for both lifts. However, the long head of the triceps are trained at different muscle lengths due to the position of the shoulder. The pushdowns train the long head at a shorter length because the shoulder is in a more extended position. The skull crusher, on the other hand, requires the shoulder to be in a more flexed position, which trains the long head at a longer muscle length. So while hypertrophy of the two short heads will probably be similar with both exercises, the long head will likely see greater muscle growth with the skull crusher in this instance. And the second practical implication that this concept has is for lifting technique, more specifically for range of motion. This research provides more reason to train through a full range of motion with whatever exercises you are performing. This is because training through a full range of motion will ensure the muscle is being stressed at a longer length, which will likely result in greater muscle growth. A classic example of this is for squats and their variations. Squatting with full depth will stretch the quads and glutes to a larger extent compared with partial range of motion. This will train these muscles at a longer length under load, probably resulting in greater muscle growth compared with partial range training. It should be noted that there are potentially other mechanisms also contributing to full range of motion training being superior, but the muscle length discussion is just one mechanism explaining this. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Check out flowhighperformance.com for online coaching, training templates, ebooks and more.